What's up everybody? We're gonna go over how to take a front battery mounted vehicle and put the battery in the back. What we do, whether it's a full blown race car, whether it's a street car, we're just gonna show you some tips and tricks, things to watch out for and things to remember when you do this. So here we have a 2013 Subaru BRZ. This has got the battery up in the front right uh, wiper cowling area. If we were to swap the battery from the front to the rear, one, why would we do this? So a couple of reasons, you're really targeting that weight balance. Some batteries are pretty heavy, that's 30 pounds. You can move it to the back. Most reasons though, is because the battery is usually up behind the headlight. We're looking at doing intercooler piping. We're looking at cleaning up the engine bay. Some guys just like to tuck the engine bay, have it nice and clean, and the battery is an unsightly thing to look under the engine bay. So I'm gonna show you what you need to watch out for in the front, where you would wanna put the battery in the back, things you wanna keep out, keep an eye for, and uh, the ways that we would do it so that it's gonna be a reliable uh, job for you. So we're gonna start by looking where this one is. So this one's tucked up in the wiper cowling. So some things we're gonna to wanna to watch out for is especially on this one and newer vehicles, you have a battery current sensor. So this is something that you do wanna maintain uh, in the vehicle as the computer does rely on information for this. If you plan on keeping a stock computer, stock components, and you're just doing this for aesthetics. So you do wanna make sure that that stays in place and stays with the battery. So you're either lengthening the cables for this, or you're gonna make a junction that maintains a battery current sensor still around the negative cable. So something to watch out for. For us though, we're always building a race car, so we don't really care about the current sensor and we'll get rid of it. Battery cable ends. I see a lot of people use just the general store-bought ones, Canadian Tire, your local AutoZone part source. Thing with those is some of the cheaper ones and they're painted red and black, which is nice. You know which one's different because these studs are different sizes but some people will not clean the paint off the inside. I've had cars towed in where they're having intermittent starting issues. They put their own battery terminals on it and it's painted on the inside. They didn't clean it up. So you wanna make sure if you do get the painted ones, the manufacturer didn't miss a step, clean the inside of the terminal. For myself, I really like the OEM style terminals, especially because they have usually built-in fuses. This one's got the current sensor in it. So what I'll normally do is just end up cutting the cable here and I'll do a butt splice from here to this one in the trunk. And you keep the OEM battery cables, nice, good fit and finish. Love the OEM look at this kind of stuff when we go to the back. So for this one's a bit unique. We've got a bunch of fuses right here on the uh, main positive stud. So one of these would be your alternator. One of these would be the positive to the fuse box. And then the main one in the middle will be to your starter. So in this case, you are gonna wanna keep these fuses intact. So you either buy an aftermarket fuse that you can, uh, circuit breaker or fuse that you can mount somewhere up here to keep the integrity of these. You'd hate to short circuit something, end up burning out a computer uh, because you didn't have the safety in place. Usually when people boost cars backwards, these are the fuses that blow, which is what saves all the modules in the car. Not that you ever intend to boost a car backwards, but I've seen it happen to even regular car people. So it is a, a good idea to keep those fuses in place. So once we've cleaned up the front, got rid of the battery of the front, we're gonna show you in the back where I would normally put the battery and where people make some mistakes sometimes when putting batteries in the trunk. If you don't care about the back, nice right and center in the wheel well, it's nice and protected from outsides. I see people put them back here in the corners behind the taillights. If you put it in here, especially if you're drifting, uh, super susceptible to be tapping the wall. As you can see even here, we got a little, uh, a little too close to someone, and if we had to tuck their battery right in that corner, it obviously would have wrecked the battery. <laughs> Big thing for batteries when you put them in the trunk, in the cabin, one for racing uh, regulations, they mandated that you must have it in a sealed box. One to keep the fumes out, uh, lead acid batteries do tend to off gas when they're going through their cycles of hot and cold. So try to keep in mind that you keep it away from your cabin area, you have it in a well ventilated area. Most manufacturers that have batteries in the trunk, in the cabin, will actually have hoses that will vent out to the outside of the car. So if it does off gas, it doesn't release it into the cabin. Most folks are doing this in race cars. There's no windows, no interior, so it doesn't really matter. But regulations do state you have to have it in some sort of an enclosure. If you're chasing that weight balance, you're probably gonna wanna put it up right on top of the rear wheel. You're gonna want it up in this area, opposite of the driver to kind of offset the corner weights by moving 30 pounds back there. We'll usually do an anti-gravity battery, which weighs a total of like five, six pounds. So the whole weight balance thing doesn't really matter. So you really wanna keep it central to the rear of the car to keep it well protected. Another thing I've also seen, you wanna make sure when you swap the battery into the trunk, that you make sure you maintain your battery boots on the terminals. One, racing regulations mandate that positive studs have to be covered. But I have seen, and ironically enough, it was a fire extinguisher rolling around in a guy's trunk where he rear swapped the car, shorted out on the positive stud and caused a fire. So we do put stuff in the trunk, you're working at the track, you slam your tools in the back, you forget about it, you drive away, something will short circuit, just keep those battery cables uh, covered up. A lot of people ask, what size cable do I use? Most cars have a four gauge, do I keep a four gauge? Do I have to run a four gauge? 
Ideally, the further you run the battery away from the source that you're trying to power, which the starter is your main draw, on average, you're two to 250 amps for a starter to draw. It doesn't hurt to upsize the cable. The longer the distance, the higher the resistance. So the more amps will be drawn through that cable. Ideally, when we're doing a rear, uh, rear swap, no less than a four gauge. If it's a small four cylinder, usually if we're doing an LS swap or a larger vehicle, it's at least a two gauge, sometimes a two double zero gauge. Um, it doesn't hurt to have that big of a wire going through the car. Lower resistance, it's just easier on everything. Uh, another thing too that we like to move the battery in the back for is now we have a nice close positive source if we're doing a rear mounted PMU. Because uh, one will have a positive stud if we don't use a butt splice at the front so we can draw our loads up the front for electric power steering PMUs uh, off the front. And then the battery can also supply any rear loads we have. Maybe you have fans, you have coolers, you have pumps, something in the rear. You can just usually power right to the battery. So it is a nice uh, caveat for that. You're not running power wires through the whole interior of the car. When we're running wires through the car, now this goes back to the days of doing stereos, you would never run your positive cable on the same side that you run your RCA wires down because you create interference. When you do have a high electrical load going through a large wire like that, it creates a magnetic field. So ideally, you want to run it down probably the passenger side of the car and try to keep it away from all your network wires. If you have speaker wires, try to keep it isolated by itself so it doesn't create any interference with anything else. Networks in cars are pretty robust, so the chances of it actually causing interference are extremely low but it's just nice to keep it away from any sensitive equipment because it does draw a lot of current and will generate a magnetic field. So if you're keeping full interior, generally uh, we'll do the pass through firewall grommet. If you don't want to be drilling too many holes, we'll get a nice boot around the cable, boot it through the firewall, under the carpet, under the sill. Usually the passenger side doesn't have as much as the driver's side. More computers are usually on the driver's side. So we'll run it on the passenger side, under the seat, into the trunk. For race car though, because race car, and we're doing a hot swap with something, we always like to use Sherlock's uh, rad locks, any sort of quick connect on your battery cables. So as you can see in this one, the battery is obviously not going to be up here. So when we're doing an engine swap, it's very nice, easy, quick. That's the starter cable. Then we'll have another one here for the PMU. So we can easily remove our devices in the front when we're at the track side trying to do a hot swap with an engine or any other electrical devices. And then they snap in super easy. So we like to do this design, this little four bolt flange, bolts right out of the firewall. Like I said, super easy. You don't have to do that Sherlock or Radlock. You could just do a simple stud through the firewall, M8 stud with a nut and bolt. That's also super easy. Again, make sure you put a boot on it. You don't wanna have anything in the engine bay shorting out. Super important to keep your battery cables clean and tidy. The OEMs have put a lot of thought into where their cables route and it stays away from critical things. Now that you're changing it, you're gonna be running cables, try not to run them under the car, but manufacturers have thought out where the cables are gonna be. Be mindful of things like exhaust. Steering shafts are a big thing. If your battery's in the front and you're running across the back of the firewall, you don't wanna be in the way of the steering shaft, have that shape through there. Axles, moving suspension components. Just keep in mind if something's moving, stay far away from it. Yeah, and another thing you wanna keep in mind, OEM manufacturers will put the battery really close to the starter, so your starter lead is extremely short. Normally the starter lead is not fused from the battery to the starter. However, now that you're going to be moving the battery into the trunk, into the cabin, you're moving it far away from the source. Lots of things could happen to that cable. You're running it in places where it might get pinched by a seat going up and down that you're not aware of. Even people just moving around on the carpet, you could chafe the wire, it could go to bare metal. So what I recommend is always put a fuse or a circuit breaker shortly after the lead to the battery. Also some rule books mandate that if you do move the battery, you need to have some sort of a fuse protection to the battery. Because if that cable shorts out, a two gauge cable will carry thousands of amps before it actually starts to burn through and it'll melt things. It's just not great. So fuse your battery, good rule of thumb. If you have a 300 amp fuse on it, that's pretty much gonna cover any engine that you have that's gonna draw that kind of power. We run 200 amps on a hot, really, really hot restart day of a high compression V8, it does trip the 200. So I just recommend going with a 300. I've seen some people use the large speaker uh, subwoofer uh, fuses, the little enclosures, 250 amp, 300 amp circuit breaker in, or a fuse in there is good too. Just an extra layer of protection because the last thing you need is to have your battery short out and cause a fire. So when we are joining the cables, you might ask how do we join two large four gauge wires together or a four and a two. So what we'll use is these large bus splices. I have a special crimper. You can use a hydraulic crimper. They're only like 90 bucks on Amazon to hydraulic crimp these. You can use a barrel crimper, um, but because they are a large cable, this isn't something that's gonna be just your little hand squeeze tool. You are gonna want something with some clamping force. So when anytime I'm doing battery cables, these are the two, two tools I like to use. These are just a really large, a uh, lot of force you can apply to the crimp on these. Different gauges there for different sizes. Mm -hmm. 
My favorite one for doing battery cables though is this relatively cheap and expensive hydraulic crimping tool. Comes with all of the different dies you need all the way from eight gauge to uh, four zero. So massive cables that you can be doing in this. Um, just super easy, reliable. And if you're gonna do battery cables, you'd rather have something like this crimping it than a hand tool and then have it come apart and cause issues later on down the road. Um, so that's the tools we'd use. Some people like to do solder. I'm not really a huge fan of solder on the cars just because the solder will wick up the wire, create a fragile breaking point, especially it's in an area where it's moving a lot. A barrel uh, crimp will not cause that fatigue uh, stress point in a wire, so always try and bust place. And then use the proper heat shrink. We always use the heat shrink that's got the glue inside it. So as cars are in an open atmosphere, Wirefly's got this really nice stuff we're doing for quick, uh, you don't have to do DR25, Raycom stuff. Um, just the simple glue line heat shrink to go over top of your uh, battery cable. Keeps it nice and reliable. Um, we've done battery swaps. I've been doing them for 15 years now and haven't had any problems with them so far. So that's how I do it. I hope this has been really helpful for you guys. If you have any questions, suggestions, things that you'd like to know about swapping your battery, let us know in the comments and we'll do our best to answer them.